and comments. All right, back to you, Ms. Castor. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, well, we all share the goal that our labs at home and abroad must adhere to stringent safety standards to design uh, any thoughtful improvements from our perspective uh, as policymakers. We really need your, your input and, and advice. Uh, Dr. Pikash, your research involves working with infectious pathogens uh, to surveil and understand flu. You also oversee a high containment lab uh, used to study particularly infectious uh, viruses. Walk us through the steps uh, that you must take each time you enter a high containment lab to study an, in an infectious pathogen. Uh, absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity to, to, to describe this. Um, I'll jump past the training, which is extensive. And oftentimes when a member joins my laboratory, for instance, it, it can be anywhere from, from a, a month to two months before they actually will go into our high containment laboratory because there's about a month or two of training that we do outside of the facility so individuals get comfortable with their techniques and their approaches. Um, our high containment laboratory has a security swipe where only limited individuals have access to the room. Uh, the, it's a multi-room facility. Each of the doors have an interlock system so that only one door can be opened at any one particular time, and the outside door is only controlled by security access from the outside as well as um, uh, emergency or ex, uh, security access from the inside. Um, we enter an area in our room where, which we call our gowning room or our ante room, and that's the space that is pathogen-free, and that's where we gown uh, to enter into the rooms of our suite where we actually will be working with pathogens. Um, that in, the, the gowning part involves us putting on a Tyvek oversuit, which is a, a moisture resistant protective barrier. We put on uh, protective gear over our feet. We put on a pair of gloves. We then down what's called an outer protective gown, which is another sort of apron that is moisture resistant. Uh, we put on a second set of gloves and then we uh, provide protection through something called PPAR, uh, 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 or a PAPR unit. And what that is, is it's a unit where we put a, a, a hood around our entire heads, we connect it via hose to a unit on the side of our uh, uh, waist, which takes air from the room, purifies it through a HEPA filter, and then sends it through the mast out uh, and out the bottom of our so mast. This is a detailed uh, uh, yeah. process. Um, and uh, Dr. Koblenz, you, you said, okay, looking at it, the U.S. and Canada rank high when it comes to our bio-risk management score. But then you highlighted the expansion of labs across the globe in, uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is our best uh, way in America to make sure that, that as labs open across the globe, what, what's, is it through the WHO? Is it through our research, uh, our collaboration, what is, what is the way to ensure that as labs open, they are adhering to high, high standards? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think we need to take a, a kind of a two-pronged approach. Um, working through organizations like the WHO and the Biological Weapons Convention can uh, enable us to set international standards for biosafety, biosecurity, and Jewish research oversight that, that all countries can aspire to. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to have more focused efforts that are working with the countries that are uh, perhaps developing their first BSL-4 laboratory. And so they need to build up uh, the, the legal and regulatory um, infrastructure expertise, as well as the training for their um, personnel who'll be working there and making sure they're able to work there you know, safely and, and securely and engage that, provide the kind of training that Dr. Peshkov is, is talking about. And I think there are um, uh, not only bilateral programs the U.S. can, can do for that, but there are um, international organizations uh, like the International Federation of Biosafety Associations, the National Experts Group of Biosafety and Biosecurity Regulators that can provide those services as well uh, and make sure that labs are and operating. Here, here's at my concern now because I've heard you've made some very important recommendations to us. Some, some say, oh, okay, uh, create a new agency, some do some more oversight. But right now, uh, under the Republicans' default on America proposal, it requires a 22% cut to NIH and significant cuts to the HHS Office of the Inspector General. That it would totally undermine the, those type of efforts and the, the ability to provide oversight. I mean, uh, uh, doc, my time's running out, but for, for the record, Dr. Crazzagrande, will you reply to us why funding NIH and its oversight mechanisms are so important and how 
uh, cuts of that magnitude would completely undermine our goals on biosafety in the U.S. and across the world. Thank you for the question, Representative Castor. Yes, my, I mean, my time is up, so I'm, you'll have to take that for the record. I, I don't understand. She's asking that you give a written response later to the question okay. because Since her time, time is, has sure. run out. Thank but you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back now. Recognize uh, the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, <clears throat> I don't want to spend my time doing this, but the exchange you just heard is act actually factually in.